What's good? It's Wu. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you are into the fight talk. This Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder 3 card has been announced and it's pretty damn phenomenal, especially by boxing standards. You know, in mixed martial arts, we obviously see stacked cards where the entire five to six fight, usually five fight pay-per-view features multiple elite level fights where there are like two or three different fights that could have headlined a given card. You don't see that as much in boxing for various reasons, but taking a look at this Fury versus Wilder 3 card, I mean, you look at the uh, the co-main event, uh, essentially, the second fight down, you've got Effie Ajagba taking on Cuban prospect Frank Sanchez. Now, Frank Sanchez has been training with the Reynosos, Canelo, and those guys, so he's getting great tutelage Effie Ajagba is looking like a phenomenon and he's, you know, got a couple viral knockouts now, but is largely untested against higher quality opponents. So this is two undefeated prospect heavyweights that are going to be colliding on the undercard here. Neither of these guys are ranked in the top 10, but, you know, whereas a lot of today's top 10 heavyweights are, you know, 35 plus years old even significantly older if you're talking, you know, Luis Ortiz, Alexander Povetkin. But in a fight like Ajagba versus Sanchez, you're basically getting the new crop. And this is going to kind of sort out a lot. You know, is, is it a bubble that's going to burst? In a lot of cases, you have, you know, surging prospects who get knocked off, you know, and then have a big significant loss, maybe, maybe followed by another. And then all of a sudden, you're not even talking about this person and excited about them anymore. So right now, you've got two guys who are surging. So, you know, props on the promoters for actually putting this one together, you know, and getting this on the undercard. You know, you've got, in this case, Bob Arum, top rank, working with PBC, Al Heyman. So in that one, I'm expecting a very um, explosive fight. I look forward to doing a preview and a true analysis and really, you know, trying to guess and pick a winner here. But I mean, if I was just to go strictly on first impressions, first thoughts, you know, I, I think I would lean Frank Sanchez. I feel like there's some, you know, technical issues on a Jogba side. Plus, you know, something about his style is, you know, so robotic. You know, uh, Richard Dwyer, online boxing an analyst, you know, pointed to the fact that he basically has to set the table, that his left jab doesn't do a whole lot in terms of actual effectiveness. It's just there to touch you so he could get in rhythm to throw his really deadly punch, his right hand. I agree with that. And if you look at, you know, a Jogba style, his, you know, chin and neck are kind of upright, whereas Frank Sanchez tends to mix it up a little bit more. He likes, you know, getting involved in some of these exchanges where the bullets are flying and both guys are throwing two plus punches, maybe three punches, and there could be a significant punch in that combination from either side that could drop the other guy. I get the impression that a Jogba is more like control the distance. Let's only engage on my terms. I don't want this to be a shootout. I don't think a Jogba, for instance, wants wants to fight a uh, Andy Ruiz who is just so comfortable with letting two, three, four punches go and is willing to go Yosemite Sam, you know, quick on the draw, who's going to get hit with whose bullets, you know, because a Jogba is about 6'6 six, six compared to Frank Sanchez's, I think, 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, so in most of Ajagba's fights, he actually has the height and reach to be able to kind of dictate most of the terms of the exchanges. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to that fight. Again, if I had to pick now, I think I would still lean Sanchez. And plus, I, I mean, it can't be understated the type of you know tutelage that I believe he's getting. You know, working with guys like uh, Canelo Alvarez and Oscar Valdez and, and and that whole squad. And so you obviously also have Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder. Um, I just did a early thoughts video on that one. Uh, you can feel free to, to check that one out. You know, I, I, did, I wasn't buying into Deontay Wilder's uh, excuses, at least the ones that were trying to point to why his legs felt so heavy with the costume and such. I felt like his legs, if, if they were heavy, you know, it was because of three reasons. Tyson Fury's leaning on him with a bunch of additional weight, 270 plus pounds, plus he's getting hit. So that's reason number one. He's getting hit is reason number two, because it's going to keep on zapping away at your legs energy the more and more your chin gets touched. 
And then three, and I think, you know, the least discussed reason why his legs probably felt heavy early is because he himself came in at a higher weight than he'd ever competed before. I don't know why that hasn't been mentioned more often. 231 pounds or something at the weigh-in for Deontay Wilder, who's usually somewhere between like 215, maybe 222, 225. That is significant. You know, maybe it does add to your punch resistance, you know, slightly broader neck and, you know, maybe bigger shoulders and stuff, more punch absorption, maybe. But the trade-off in that is that you're carrying, carrying around more weight with every step you take, step forward, step back, and as you're getting hit, your legs at a certain point, yeah, I'm sure are gonna feel like cinder blocks, especially the way that Fury was coming at him in that second fight. So yeah, I can't wait for that one. Feel free to uh, take a look at the uh, at the early thoughts video as we approach the date. I'm gonna do a true preview, but I wanna switch gears and get into this third fight on the Fury versus Wilder three undercard. And that is the rematch between Robert Hellenius, super tall, heavyweight, like six, seven, six, eight, who upset the surging prospect, the Polish Brooklynite, Adam Konachki who, you know, PBC has started to feature more and more prominently as he would beat guys like uh, Arthur Spilka, who's kind of, you know, a significant, I, I don't love using the term, but stepping stone for guys who are getting to the next level. A lot of them had to beat, you know, Arthur Spilka at some point, Deontay Wilder included. But with that Adam Konachki versus Robert Hellenius showdown, you know, before the first fight, as they're leading into the fight, I'm thinking about Adam Konachki's previous fight versus Chris Ariola, who, okay, let's keep it real. He has really uh, exceeded expectations in both of his last fights versus Konachki and most recently versus Andy, uh, Andy Ruiz. But versus Konachki, Konachki was coming in as the guy who was basically the pressure fighter who, I mean, uh, Ariola is obviously a pressure fighter as well, but a you know, they were also looking at the market. He's a New Yorker from Poland. There are a lot of, Pol you know, uh, Polish people in New York, you know, Chicago. And, you know, Poland is kind of a, uh, a heritage that has been tapped into less in recent years. You've had like Andres Fanfara, uh, Andrew Galata uh, before that. So they were kind of building him up as he would start, you know, he would maintain that zero in the loss column, start, you know, beating better and better people, stopping most of them because he does carry punch, uh, punching power and likes to throw in combinations as he's, you know, pinning his opponents, kind of jabbing them, jabbing them to the body, but getting them into the ropes so he could really let his hands go. A little similar to Andy Ruiz in that regard, but in a more Jarrett Hurd style way, I was looking at this recent fight between him and Chris Ariola, and I'm expecting, you know, Konachki to just more or less handle business and not necessarily turn this into a shootout where both guys are receiving heavy dam damage over the course of several rounds but this fight ended up breaking the record for like most punches either thrown or landed both guys were getting bludgeoned and although Konachki won against Ariola via decision I'm like damn I don't know how sustainable that type of style is especially in the heavyweight division that just doesn't seem to you know be able to last long fight after fight after fight it might look great now and you are getting these guys out of there he didn't get Ariola out of there but before that he more or less was you're just taking too many punches per round and so coming into the Konachki versus Hellenius one fight I'm picking Konachki to win but saying you know, I think that he's shown this vulnerability against Ariola, but I don't think that it's going to rear its head in this fight. I think that he's going to beat Robert Hellenius. Well, it was a lot of back and forth, and Konachki was the one doing most of the significant damage in the first two and a half to three, you know, close to three rounds. But in like either the third or fourth, I mean, he got hurt in like the second, and you could start to see, okay, Konachi's taking a big step back. That right hand landed, because again, Hellenius is like 6'7", six, 6'8". Six, Konachi's like 6'3". So Konachi's, you know, jabbing Hellenius back, working him into the ropes, and again, letting his hands go. But Hellenius is finding opportunities to stick his jab out there, because he's the one with the height and the reach. And so he is peppering, you know, Konachi a fair amount. And he's shooting that right hand, and then coming across with the left hook after the right hand. 
And so couple that with the combinations that Konachki's throwing as he's getting those opportunities to close the distance, they're both trading bullets again. And the busier Hellenius gets with his jab, to couple that with those hard right hands, you see Konachki start to relent a little bit, but it's a, it's a wildfire fight by the time this fight hits the third round and then into the fourth, Konachki's now the one who's getting hit. They kind of tie up and kind of lock arms and then Konachki hits the canvas. The ref rules it a slip. One of the commentators kind of calls it out saying, hey, I'd like to take a look at that replay because it looked like he actually got hurt with that. And then just as he's saying that, Hellenius puts Konachki down with the right hand. And then Konachki gets up, but su you know suffers a few more significant punches. Ref stops the fight, but it was that right hand. But it was you know the repeated process of Konachki getting clipped here and there, and just getting hit with the same punches in those same circumstances that he was getting into that slugfest versus Areola with. So I kind of think that that Konachki versus Areola fight might have been a pyrrhic victory where you win the fight but you suffered a lot more on the back end that you're going to have to account for going forward. So it's almost like, was that type of win worth it? And I'm really curious to see what uh, Konachki is going to return with. I still think that I would favor him, even though he got put out in the first fight against Hellenius, I still might go Konachki in the rematch, in the rematch but I I'm seeing this like Jarrett heard like potential expiration date on that type of style because you know we just saw jerry hurd get beat um by luis arias in that upset on the mayweather logan paul undercard and jerry hurd was another guy with this style where you are overwhelming the opponent with volume activity strength punching power and went by strength and punching i mean bodily strength and punching power because you know Hurd was has been one of these guys where i don't know how the hell he keeps on making 154 how the hell is jared Hurd fighting at 154 for so long now konachki doesn't have the same build relative to the division that jared Hurd has he has more of that andy ruiz build and again kind of a similar you know likes to put his punches together in combinations style as andy ruiz but yeah, he's getting hit way too much. I don't know if it's because he's not changing levels as much as Andy Ruiz is, even though Ruiz had his difficulties, obviously, with Ariola recently as well. But it'll be interesting to see how much belief and confidence Hellenius comes into this rematch with and how many of the doubts still linger with Adam Konachki. So yeah, I look forward to doing a uh, preview vid on that one as the fight date approaches as well. So yeah, I am just really, really pleased at having these be the three main fights, the three biggest fights on this Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder three undercard. Please let me know your thoughts on this one. This is a promotion done right. Even if most people would have rather seen Tyson Fury versus Anthony Joshua, I really think that this fight card came together and is coming together beautifully. Three uh, action-packed, I mean, who knows what the hell these fights are going to end up looking like. I mean, a lot of fight cards and fights look good on paper and end up looking like crap when you the fight actually takes place and vice versa. You get surprised with a lot of, you know, fights where you couldn't tell on paper that it was going to mat materialize the way that it did. But yeah, I, at least on the surface, I love this card right now. But please leave your comments in the comments, like the video, subscribe to the channel if you are into the fight talk. I'm Woog. Thanks for tuning in.